God, that is our prayer that you would ever be before us. Lord, that we would wholly be humbled before you, submitted to you in reverent worship in all of life. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. going to be looking again at Paul's prayer for the Colossians in chapter 1. Paul is writing by way of reminder to a church that he has not visited. He has not met them. He's only heard reports, and Paul is hearing this report of their faith in Christ Jesus. He says this in verse 3 of chapter 1. And looking at his prayer last week, we saw that we saw the things he thanks God for in the lives of the Colossians. We saw what he thanks God for in the lives of the Colossians. And this morning, what we're going to see is we're going to see Paul's petitions on behalf of the Colossians. We're going to see the burden of a shepherd, the burden of a shepherd for fellow believers. There's much to learn from Paul's prayer. Most of us, if not all of us, would say that our prayer life is not all that it should be. It's not as robust as it should be. And I believe prayer is a growing discipline for the believer. It should be until the day we are with our Savior. And yet we should strive to grow in prayer. It should be a staple of our life. And it is a kindness of the Lord that he uses the prayers of his people to advance the growth of his people. We know that prayer does matter. Prayer is a critical, crucial means of growing an individual in their faith personally and of God growing his church corporately. And Paul's request on behalf of the Colossians, these requests, they do a couple of things for us. First of all, it demonstrates an exemplary model of prayer for us as we see what Paul is concerned with for the Colossians, but it also reveals some things that we should be concerned with for one another and for ourselves personally. What matters most in the Christian life? What should be on our heart? What should be the burden of our hearts as we come before God in humble prayer? What will have the greatest bearing on our souls? What will have the greatest impact on our lives? What will bring the most glory to God? These are the things we should be concerned about. And what we pray actually reveals much about what we value and what we believe. If we don't pray, it reveals a lot about what we value and what we believe. Paul has a pastoral concern that these believers, this church, would be stable in their faith, that they would endure, that they would press on, that they would walk in Christ, that they would persevere to the end, that they wouldn't be persuaded by another gospel, by an imitator faith, a false Christ. And so Paul on behalf of these believers, is concerned with their souls before God, and he is praying a big prayer, a high prayer, a significant prayer. He is praying for what matters most, and we see there is no place for for perfunctory prayers in Paul's life. He gets to the core. He gets to the root of what really matters, and Paul does this as he prays for the Colossians' thinking. He prays for their thinking, And then he prays for their walk. And some would say that these are in competition with each other, that knowledge puffs up and leads to legalism and an arrogant walk. That we shouldn't take a definitive stand on anything, but the key issues and we should live in undefined harmony with one another, promoting peace and love. Some would say that we don't want to get caught up in the details. Just love and trust God and don't fixate on truth, especially on peripheral things. Paul knows better. There's no direction for our lives if our lives aren't grounded in the truth. We need truth. We need God's word. We need a biblical grounding in truth, in faith, that then leads to a holy life. That is God's intention. 
That is his desire for his people. That the Spirit of God would use the truth of God to enable the people of God to glorify God. That's God's desire. This should be the aim for every believer that we would want to please God in all that we do. To glorify him, to please him. That should be our aim. To please him in every respect. And we do this in response to God by faith. Paul's going to give a sweet, intentional, intimate prayer on behalf of these fellow believers whom he's never even met. We see what he's truly concerned with in the lives of believers. Let's look at our passage this morning. Colossians 1, we're going to read verses 9 through 14. Colossians 1, starting in verse 9. Paul says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here we see that Paul displays his pastoral burden for fellow believers through diligent petitions. Paul displays his pastoral burden for fellow believers through diligent petitions. Paul has a a pastoral burden for the Colossians and presents these requests to the only one with power to grant these things as he prays to God. And his mature pastoral burden shines through in his prayer. Paul displays his pastoral burden for fellow believers through diligent petitions. And what is this first petition that we see? Well, it's this. Paul prays for a word-permeated life, a word-permeated life permeated life. We see this in verse 9. Look again at verse 9. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So the life directed and fixed upon scripture, and we'll unpack that a bit here now. Paul says, for this reason also since the day we heard, and translators added the words of it, referring really to the whole of what he's just thanked God for, but primarily their faith in Jesus and the love for the saints. These are demonstrations that they indeed are in Christ. They are indeed in the faith. And he says, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask or to specifically request on your behalf. These are diligent petitions that Paul is making on behalf of the Colossians. And the point isn't that it's the only thing he ever prayed for the Colossians, but the pastoral burden for them relating to these things was so intense that these are the things he kept coming back to and over and over again in regards to these precious believers, these precious saints, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. This word for filled is is really fascinating. It's the idea of a sail on a sailboat being filled in order to propel the boat along. This is a saturation that leads to movement. This is that you are overflowing. It is, it is spilling out of you. You are saturated like a sponge. It oozes out of you. Knowledge of God's will. There is deep spiritual insight that is given to those who understand God's will in this way. This isn't a surfacey knowledge. This is a permeation with the knowledge of God's will, and this is key for every believer. Every Christian benefits from this kind of filling of God's will and God's an understanding of God's word. 
And, and there's a reason Paul is starting here, I believe. The Colossians were under attack by those who were proponents of a teaching that they needed better knowledge, more superior knowledge. They needed deeper spiritual insight than what Christianity offered alone. Gnostics were teaching that Christ, yeah, he's all right, he's, he's good, but there's a deeper spiritual insight that we need, a deeper knowledge and a deeper understanding that they could experience, a superior wisdom and insight. And those in arrogance were saying, scriptural truth, that's not enough. The gospel, that's not enough. The Christian way of thinking was viewed as narrow, trivial, and lacking. They had greater insight, and they had real spiritual insight. Does this sound familiar with what we're hearing even today? The word Paul uses for knowledge is epigenosis, which is a compound word combining upon and knowledge together. And this prefix of upon, it actually intensifies the root word and demonstrates the fullness, the depth, and the completeness of the knowledge. Here are the Gnostics saying, you need a deeper truth, you need a, a better truth. And here's Paul saying, I pray that you have all spiritual knowledge of God's will, that you have an understanding of God's will and all spiritual insight that is a deep, profound understanding of what God has revealed, one that intersects personally within your lives. Paul wants them to know in the mind and experience in their life this truth. And in saying it this way, Paul again is praying for more than a mental recognition of truth, but a life saturated with an understanding of God's will. See, many people know things about God. Many people know things about God. Demons know truth about God. But what Paul is praying for here is a supernatural knowledge of God's will. This is a knowledge of objective truth from Scripture that the Spirit molds within your life. Paul here isn't praying like we often do and praying for an understanding of God's will that it's some abstract idea of what's going to happen in the future. Should I take this job or should I take this job? God, give me an understanding of your will. No, this, this is a knowledge of God's will that is attainable and life impacting and it's found in his word. It's revealed in his word and understood by the power of his spirit a real knowledge that is birthed by the Spirit of God that then empowers us to live out that truth. And Paul says with all wisdom and understanding, he's praying for a life that is grounded in what God's word reveals as principles and knowledge of scripture and principles that come from it, and then for spiritual insight that then understands the practical grasp of the truths that aids you in how to function in relation to those truths. He's saying he wants them to know the concept of truths and principles that God has given and that they would have a practical grasp of those things that aids them in how they function in light of those truths, that we would have a comprehensive filling of the knowledge of God and his will expressed through an understanding of what God has revealed in Scripture and then the ability to live rightly in light of those things. You could sum it up this way. What are God's specific instructions and how should I live for his glory today in light of those? That's what he's praying. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. That should be impressed on our minds. It's so easy to get caught up in our own desires and our own will and our own agenda, our own ambitions, and to neglect God's will, what he has clearly revealed from Scripture, his desire is for his people it's easy to get caught up in our lives and in our prayers with what we want to happen around us and to neglect what God has clearly said his intentions and desire is for within us. I believe our prayers need to be much more saturated with pleas for God to conform us to his will then requests for God to conform to ours. We need to echo our Savior, not my will be done, but yours. 
What if each morning we came to God's word with this mindset? For our own hearts and for one another, God, reveal to me the real knowledge of what you have revealed in your word in a way that would permeate my life and give to me all wisdom and insight to navigate everything that comes into my life today, driven by your will, saturated in your truth, depending on your power, having insight into your desires for me in every circumstance. What if we prayed that for each other? God would be so pleased to answer that. And what's encouraging is you do, you do pray this for each other. And God is answering those prayers. This is crucial for the believer. Mind renewal, aligning our thinking with God's, not leaning on our own understanding, but looking to God in every situation. We're asking ourselves, what has God said about this issue, right? We need that now more than ever as we're getting bombarded with everybody's opinions and everybody's thoughts on every issue, to stop and say, God, what have you said about this? And particularly, what have you said your desire is for me in this? Right? We can't control everything going on around us, but we can address the sin in our hearts. We can repent and we can press forward in the midst of this world in faith, seeking to glorify God in obedience, humble obedience before him. It's far too easy to get caught up in what others have to say about things and not run to the one who has divine wisdom, who possesses all power, who is orchestrating all things. We wouldn't go to a drugstore for information about how a computer chip functions within our laptop. We'd go to the engineer We'd go to the designer, the one who created it. And yet we're too often too quick to allow ourselves to go to voices that have nothing to do with the grand scheme of what God is accomplishing. God is the one who has purposed it. God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who is working all things according to his will. And so we humbly come before him as he is the ultimate source of all wisdom and understanding. An answer to this prayer has powerful implications, powerful implications, and Paul knows it, and we see that actually in his next request, in his next petition. It flows from the first. He prays that these believers would have a word-permeated life, a life that is saturated with the word of God, that is overflowing with the word of God, so that... And this is the next pastoral burden that flows from the first, and it's this, so that they would have a walk worthy of the Lord. We see this in verses 10 through 14, a walk worthy of the Lord. That's number two, a walk worthy of the, of the Lord. This flows from a word-permeated life. Uh, this is the goal for the knowledge that Paul is praying for. This is the outcome of the filling of this knowledge in their lives, and it's that their lives would be changed. Their lives would be conformed, not to this world, but to a a means that that is in measure with Christ. It's that the conduct of their daily life, their walk, would be worthy of the Lord. Look at verse 10. He says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. This term for worthy of the Lord has the notion of bringing into balance. Bringing into balance, it was used to describe the balancing of two sides of a scale. And so when Paul says to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, he's saying to have conduct in life, to have a life that is characterized in measure with the Lord. Have this word-permeated life so that your walk that flows out of it would be in measure with Christ's life. This isn't a, a look to your internal worth or to yourself to merit God some in some way. God is infinitely worthy and look at Christ, look at how much he's worth. And now you need to find that worth within yourself and measure up. That's not what Paul's saying at all. 
No, he's saying in light of who Christ is and what he has accomplished in the gospel, live in accordance with that work. Live in a way that makes sense in light of the fact that you are a redeemed one by Christ. This isn't a demand for perfection. We know we won't attain that in this life. John makes that clear in 1 John, but this is a life that is characterized in consistency with the Lord himself. That the pattern of our lives, the pattern of our life would be characterized by that which is consistent with Jesus. Uh, Paul actually further explains this by saying to please him in all respects. To please him in all respects. You see that there in verse 10. What is a walk that is worthy of the Lord? What is a walk that is in measure with the Lord? It is a life that is pleasing to God in all respects. And this should be the goal of every believer. This should be our aim, our agenda as a church. We should long for this. God, help us to walk in in a manner worthy of you. Help us to have a disciplined and intentional pattern of life that is in line with, that measures up to you so that we might please you in all respects. This isn't a life of conformity in certain areas and neglect in others. No, where we see sin, we repent. And we seek to mature in the Lord. What what are some temptations that we might face when considering this? Well, One is this, we might actually find ourselves comparing ourselves with each other. We might compare ourselves with each other as the standard for our Christian walk, right? The standard of our conduct is not to be compared with one another. I'm not doing well as a Christian because look at this person and they're clearly not doing as good as I am. So as long as I can be a notch above them, my conscience is clean before the Lord. No, that's not how we think. That's wicked to think that way. The standard, the aim is Christ. We don't settle for trying to be one step above each other. The aim is to imitate Christ, to have your life please him. In all regards. Another struggle might simply be disbelief in a spirit enabled life to be able to walk in victory over sin. We don't believe that God has indeed given us what we need to be obedient to Him. You might be thinking, Josh, to to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to, to please Christ, to have the pattern of my life consistent with Christ, that's unrealistic. That'll never happen. Listen, we're messy people. We're just messy all the time. And so don't be so hard on yourself. Don't take sin seriously. We might be sad or feel bad about our sin, but we're unwilling to do the hard work of repentance. We don't have faith in the power of God to give us growth and victory over the sin in our lives. And I'm concerned that we, we struggle with the same sins over and over because we actually aim for the wrong target. We aim for the wrong things. We're content with too little. We recognize God's divine power that saves us and rescues us from eternal wrath for our sins that our sin deserves, that we deserve in our sin, but we think too little at times about the divine power that God grants his people to be able to overcome sin and walk in obedience. Paul, upon hearing of the faith of the Colossians, he prays for their ever-growing understanding of the knowledge of God's will so that they then would walk in a manner that is in measure with Christ. And he gives the, the clarifying statement that they would be pleasing to God. What a wonderful standard. What a, what a wonderful goal to have before us, not for the appeasement of God, Right? Not that he's, he's waiting in the corner, making sure that we measure up, but in response to God. That we wouldn't squander the means of grace that he has given us to accomplish the very goals that we should have and the longings that we should have as those who have been reconciled by his grace. And just for clarity, we'll, we'll never be equal with Christ's holiness in this life. 
but we're called to walk in a manner appropriate or consistent with the person of Jesus. What does this walk that is pleasing to the Lord look like? Well, Paul actually presents four things that characterize a Christ-pleasing life, four things that characterize a walk that is worthy of the Lord. And he sets this out starting in verse 10. He calls it a, a fruit-bearing walk, or we could summarize it that way. If you look at verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, bearing fruit in every good work. Please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Paul prays that they would bear fruit in their lives. In essence, this is that they would make the right decision and the best decision in every way, every time. That they would be fruitful, that they would please God in each circumstance that they find themselves in. They would conduct themselves in a way that produces fruit that is pleasing to the Lord they would conduct themselves in a way that brings glory to God, spiritual good in every choice. That's what he prays for. Well, what does this look like to bear fruit in our lives? What does this look like to bear fruit in our walk? Well, first we have to know what pleases God. What does God call fruit? And when we put off everything that is a hindrance to this, we embrace what leads to fruit. We submit ourselves fully to God's word and his instruction. You see how the two are connected. Our understanding of God's will, our knowledge, our wisdom, our discernment before the Lord aids us in our obedience to this petition that Paul makes on behalf of the Colossians. That we would fully submit ourselves to God's word and his instruction. To bear fruit in every good deed must be accompanied by a humble disposition toward God's instruction. We will not accomplish this to bear fruit if our heart and our, our minds are hardened to God's instruction. We can't look to get out of God's instruction. We habitually humble ourselves under God's word and under God's instruction when we seek to bear fruit in our walk. What else? To please God in our walk, we should seek to be, to have a fruit-bearing walk. Next, a pleasing walk is to have a knowledge-increasing walk. A knowledge-increasing walk. Look at this, uh, the last part of verse 10, an increasing in the knowledge of God. Our growth in the Lord, the trajectory of, trajectory of our life, will grow as we increase in our knowledge of God. This is a divinely enabled, self-perpetuating cycle. Uh, what does that mean? You, you know truth by the Spirit of God. You walk in obedience to that truth. God then, in your obedience to him, increases your knowledge, and you continue to grow in holiness, which comes from a greater desire for God's will, leading to an ever-increasing knowledge of God that leads again to greater holiness. What a wonderful cycle to be in. Have you ever felt like reading your Bible was dry? I've read my Bible a ton. I know what it has to say. Or, or that you are simply doing it out of obligation. Let me recommend in those moments to pray, God, I resolve to please you in every regard today. And Lord, I need to know you. I need to have greater understanding of your will. I need to know you so that I might be fortified in truth, enabled by your power to resist sin and to be holy, that I might bear fruit in every good work that you might bring before me this day. Let's aim to pray those kinds of prayers for ourselves and for each other, that we would not grow cold to an ever-increasing knowledge and understanding of our Lord. Or think that simply to grow in knowledge of God is somehow unfruitful or not worthwhile? Thirdly, a divinely enabled walk. What does a, a walk that is pleasing to the Lord look like? It's a divinely enabled walk. We see this in verse 11. Look again. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might with a purpose for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. 
This is where you're being strengthened with all power. This is being done to you. You aren't generating this power. You aren't conjuring up this power. It is granted to you. This is God strengthening you. Have you ever felt just defeated in your Christian walk? Why did I do it again? Oh, I know I need to fight, but I don't know if I have it in me. I don't know if I can do it again. Consider this for a moment. Have you ever had or known a children's sports team that was just really, really bad? I mean, like, really bad, okay? And it didn't matter how hard they tried. Every game they got blown out, you knew it, they knew it, the coach knew it, all the parents knew it, the other team knew it, the other team's parents knew it. It didn't matter the effort. It didn't matter the, the teamwork or the coaching. They were just always outmatched. It didn't matter how hard they tried. They weren't going to win. Sometimes we go through our Christian walk like that, where we think it's over before we've even started. I'm going I'm to try, but I don't expect to win. I know myself. I know my sinfulness. That's not God's design for the Christian walk. Defeated before we even get out of bed. Well, I gave it my best shot. That's not biblical thinking. And in fact, that kind of thinking is actually ultimately blaming God for your lack of victory over sin. You lack faith. You disbelieve that God has actually given to you what you need to be victorious in your sin, to please him, to resist sin, to walk in holiness. If you're a Christian, you never lose the battle against sin because you lack the resources needed to have victory over sin. Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you, and Paul's prayer is that the Colossians would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, and God loves to answer this prayer. He actually tells us that there's no temptation that is overtaking you, but what is common to man, and with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape. He has told us that he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. He doesn't hold back. He's not stingy. When it comes to his children, he is generous with the resources his children need to please him. What a wonderful truth. If you're feeling hopeless in sin today, share that with somebody. Ask them to pray that you would be filled with all power to be able to walk in a way that is pleasing to him. Pray that for yourself and know that God will not ask of you what he does not give you through his grace to accomplish. What's interesting, Paul, what's on his mind with this all power is empowering for them and particularly for steadfastness and patience. Can I have all power to get out of my trials? That would be a lot nicer. Can, can you grant me all power to remove hardship from my life? That's not what Paul prays. He actually prays for all powers so that they can remain steadfast and patient in the midst of whatever God has for them in their life. That's God's, God's primary intention is not to remove hardships, but to sustain and create steadfastness and patience within his children. Steadfastness, it's to remain under a difficult circumstance. Patience, this has an emotional quietness in the face of unfavorable circumstances to stay with it, to not give up, to be steadfast. And you don't need this when life is easy. This life is hard. Trials come. And in those times, where do you find your heart drawn? Do you find yourself praying for divine power to change your circumstances or for divine power to be steadfast in whatever circumstances may come your way? And it's not automatically sin to pray for a change of circumstances. Paul prayed for the removal of the thorn in his flesh, in his flesh and Jesus prayed, if there's a way to remove this cup, do it. But what was their spiritual disposition before the Lord? That of humility, not my will be done, but your will be done. And God did grant them both steadfastness and patience in the midst of their 
difficulty. This prayer really roots out the idol idol of a trial-free life where we think our, our troubles are particularly because of the things around us, and if God changed these things around us, then the things that I see coming out that I don't like wouldn't come out so much, but that's just not true. Sin will reveal itself. It will come out, and it's not because of the things around us. It's because of what is within us. And how much better is it that God grants to us a divine power to be able to address what is in us, which actually does matter for us, than to change circumstances simply around us. And yet he's loving and he wants to hear the prayers of his people and oftentimes he does change circumstances, but that's not our hope and that's not our drive. Our our resolve is to please the Lord, not get what we want. Lastly, what characterizes a God-pleasing walk? It's this. It's a thanks-filled walk, a a walk that's characterized by thankfulness, a thanks-filled walk. Look at verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. A walk that's pleasing to God is a walk that is continually in your heart, having an abiding and ongoing attitude of gratefulness to God with joy. You're joyously doing this. And as a believer, you always have something to give thanks for, to be joyful over. And what is it? It's that he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light, in light. Here we see another reference to eschatological truths. Remember in verse 5, he talked about the hope laid up in heaven. Here we see that the Father has qualified us, meaning we weren't qualified before on our own. God has done this, and now we have an inheritance along with other true saints. And this is truly a staggering truth. True Israel will receive their inheritance one day in the kingdom. And for the Father to qualify the Colossians to share in this inheritance, and really every believer has a share in that inheritance, would have seemed unconscionable to these early believers. And the language is so specific. When Paul says, qualified us to share in the inheritance, it's that he has qualified us to a specific, defined share or portion or claim. It's not some abstract thing far away. Paul gives clarity to this reality in verse 13. Look there, he says, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We have a new citizenship that is current and now and will be expressed fully when Christ returns and establishes his perfect rule. What a gift. What a heart-gripping reality. We are citizens of Jesus' kingdom, and God did this through the redemption that is offered in Christ, the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Understanding that you have a share, that you have a portion of the inheritance, that you have a new citizenship, understanding what God has done in the gospel changes everything. Everything about our thinking, our perspective, our expectations, What you live for, how you live, how you view trials, how you view successes, what you view as a success, what you pursue, how you pursue those things, what you value, everything is impacted by this reality of what God has done through his son, Jesus. And our lives, the pattern of our walk, will not be ruled by entitlement when we think this way but overwhelming gratitude and humble thankfulness. And that characterizes a life that is pleasing to God, one of thanks for the great love of God demonstrated in his son. As we wrap up, how how intense are we about these things? How thoughtful are we about these things? How devoted are we to this happening in one another's lives to have this kind of word-saturated permeated life in this kind of God-pleasing walk. I participate in my small group, and I hear of what God is doing in your lives. I praise God for his grace. 
I am so encouraged by the ways that you, as a body, love God's word. That characterizes you. And you desire to be holy. That characterizes you as well. Let us press on more in this. And let us go to the Lord more diligently, even more diligently, in our requests for this for each other. And in our own lives. That God would be seen as the great God that he is in our lives. That we would please him in all that we do for the glory of his name as we recognize that any good that comes from us isn't rooted out of us, but it is only enabled by the divine power of a gracious, generous, loving God. Do you know this God? If you're a part of Grace Bible Church, have been here for a while, but don't know Christ this way, don't long for these things, talk to an elder, talk to one of us, one of the pastors. We would love to be available for you. If you're visiting and this is new, you've never heard something quite like this, please talk to one of us here this morning. I'd love to share with you more about this wonderful good news of a life that is committed to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we are so awed by your wisdom and your goodness and your love and your care for your people. Thank you for the means of grace that you put into your people's lives to enable them to bring glory and honor to you. It would be a, an impossible task if left to our own resources. We wouldn't be able to do it. We wouldn't have a desire to do it. As we know that prior to your saving grace in our lives, we were enemies of you. We were at enmity with you. We were under your wrath. All we wanted to do was suppress truth about you. And now we want to be grounded in truth. We want to have an ever-increasing knowledge and understanding of truth. And so, Lord, give us a zeal for you to know you even more and give us strength to walk in obedience and light of those truths that are so precious and so life-changing and, and so life-giving. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.